Okay, so we are live now. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Priya Shravastav. I am the executive editor for Business Insider in London. Um, it's a pleasure to host another of Horasis uh, events today. I've um, uh, been associated with Horasis for uh, nearly three years now, and I've always been very amazed at the kind of events and the kind of panels that we put together. It's extremely interesting. Um, the one today is very special. It's talking about uh, a, a particular topic that has sort of taken a back seat in the last few months because of the pandemic that has come upon us. Um, I remember that late last year, uh, you know, climate change was a, was a topic that was at the top of everyone's list. We were talking about it with the likes of Greta Thunberg out there protesting and, you know, young people talking about it so much in companies, countries, um, revisiting their climate change, uh, you know, uh, di uh, directives and commitments. And then come 2020 January, we all started getting, you know, focusing on something totally different, something that we had not expected will actually take up uh, our mind, um, and that was COVID. And suddenly everything else started taking a backseat. Um, and, you know, we, we started putting our energy, our money, our focus in, 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 you know, inspiration, everything just went into resources, everything just went into how do we deal with a crisis as big as COVID-19. Um, and we are still in the midst of this pandemic. We are at the height of this pandemic. Um, and one positive that has come out of this pandemic um, uh, has been all of these beautiful pictures you see from across the world where you see um, pollution levels receding, where you see the, uh, you know, I was speaking to somebody in Italy a couple of weeks ago where I was writing a story about um, the lockdown and somebody told me that how they have this beautiful river um, next to their house and that started looking blue all over again. And she showed me pictures about from six years ago when that river was absolutely dirty. So while the human invasion, uh, you know, the lack of the sort of human invasion has uh, uh, had made these uh, rivers and pollution, you know, pollution levels so high, the lockdown has brought that down quite a lot. But we know that COVID is not here to stay for a long time. We know that tomorrow there'll be a vaccine and we'll all go back to our normal lives. We'll all go back to doing what we want to do, um, and which would mean that industries and countries will again have to um, deal with a crisis that is, that is right there in front of us. So we'll discuss more about this today. We've got some very interesting panelists. We've got um, Gabriel, uh, Gabriel Cahandria. Uh, who is the Deputy Minister um, uh, for uh, Strategic Development for Natural Resources from Peru. Uh, we were meant to have Diego Mesa, Minister of Mines and Energy from Colombia, but I think we, uh, he's having some technical problems. So as soon as he's able to join us, um, we'll be able to talk uh, to him as well. Um, and then uh, Petteri Talas is the Secretary General of World Meteorological Organization from Switzerland. He sent us a really beautiful message from Geneva. Um, so uh, Secretary Talas, the floor is yours. So greetings from uh, World Meteorological Organization in Geneva. I'm Secretary General Talas and uh, we are the specialized agency on weather, climate and water. And I'm sorry that I cannot join you uh, face to face uh, th th this time, but I'm happy to deliver this uh, message uh, through to, to you through video. And uh, and since we are an expert, expert organization on climate and climate change, uh, I'd like to say, say a few words about uh, that. We just published a new United in Science report as a joint venture of WMO, IPCC, which we are hosting here, UNEP, uh, Global Carbon Project, and, uh, and UNESCO, where we described what we know about climate change and uh, emissions and uh, what is the challenge that we have ahead of, ahead of us. When I studied meteorology in the early 80s, uh, I, I learned to know a secret thing called climate change uh, that was still not known worldwide but the WMO had uh, just decided to establish IPCC and uh, the first reports were published in the in the 80s. And we were more afraid of a nuclear war than climate change at uh, that time. Since then, the, change, uh, the situation has changed. The climate change has become from a theoretical thing to a practical thing, which is already observed. We have started seeing growing amount of uh, disasters because of that we, uh, we have seen more often flooding events, uh, we have seen more often storms, especially in the tropical zones, and uh, 
And, and then we have uh, seen record-breaking temperatures and, and also drought problems. And, and these, has, these have, for example, led uh, to forest fires, which we, we have observed in Australia, Siberia, uh, Canada, Sweden, and now in western part of the uh, United States. And, and they are all record-breaking. And, and that, those are all, to a certain degree, indications of uh, climate change. Not every variability is related to climate change. We have seen 1.1 degree warming so far and last five years where the warmest uh, on record. And we have uh, been heating, we have, we have been storing most of the extra heat to oceans and they have been warmed by half degree, which is giving more energy for, for tropical storms and uh, it's also enhancing the evaporation. So we have more humidity in the atmosphere, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, causing challenges when it comes to flooding, flooding problems. When it rains, it more, it rains more nowadays. Uh, we have break, broken records in, in main greenhouse gas concentrations, again, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And out of those, uh, th those uh, carbon dioxide is the most important. It, it has uh, caused uh, two-thirds of the warming, and, uh, and we have broken already a couple of years ago, 400 ppm level of carbon dioxide, and, uh, and recently we have seen numbers between 410 and 420. And uh, and this COVID situation has, uh, we, have, we have seen a drop in the emissions uh, for a short while. In, in April, for example, we were 17% below uh, the, the levels of 2019 in emissions. And, and altogether this year, we expect to see 4 to 7% drop in the emissions. But uh, since the lifetime of carbon dioxide is so long, this doesn't change the big uh, picture. And we have actually returned back to more or less normal emission levels uh, in recent uh, months. And, uh, and how to tackle this problem, that's a good question. We have seen that uh, there's a growing amount of uh, countries who are interested in, in, in doing something about it. For example, uh, European Union is uh, planning a very ambitious uh, Green Deal program, and we just learned uh, a week ago that uh, China is also uh, planning to become carbon neutral by 2060, which is, which is good news since China is the it's the last, largest emitter. And also in the USA, positive things are happening. They have fulfilled already half of their Paris pledges, and many states are, are proceeding, uh, and they have ambitious uh, climate mitigation programs. And, uh, and uh, what is the challenge ahead? Uh, we, have, uh, we produce at the moment 85% of the global energy based on fossil, fossil fuels, and that's also including traffic. So, coal, oil, and, and gas, and, and we produce only 15% of the global energy based on, on, on uh, climate-friendly uh, ways. Uh, those are nuclear energy, hydropower, and uh, renewable energy. And, and to be successful in climate mitigation, we should convert our fossil uh, business to become uh, carbon-free or uh, use only only very limited amount of fossil fuels in the future. We should produce most of the energy globally by based on nuclear, hydro, and renewables. And, and we, we have also plenty of energy saving solutions. In transport sector, uh, we, have, uh, we, have, we are supposed to have more electric vehicles and use more biofuels. And, uh, and also, also hydrogen is, is one of the opportunities. Public transportation should be favored more. And, uh, and also biking and, and walking should be favored uh, much more. And um, so, so the world is moving in the right direction, and uh, I'm per personally quite optimistic that we are, we are, we are moving, and, and uh, also the private sector is moving, and also the finance sector has started moving. But it's a question whether we will reach the Paris uh, limits, 1.5 to 2 degrees, or whether we will go beyond that. In the, in, uh, with, with the current uh, efforts, uh, we would reach higher numbers than 1.5 to 2. We would reach more than 3 degrees warming by the end of this century, but, uh, but uh, all, all the efforts that uh, are going on at the moment uh, may lead to lower numbers than three degrees, uh, finally. That, that's, that's my optimistic view, and, uh, and, and also as part of this COVID recovery package, many countries have decided to invest in climate-friendly technologies, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's good news. So with these words, uh, greetings from Geneva, and uh, I'd like to wish you all a very successful symposium. Uh, of course, this is a virtual one, not, not in Portugal as normally, but uh, hopefully we can 
meet each other next year in also physically in Portugal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Secretary Talas and uh, uh, Deputy Minister Kihandria. It looks like it's just you and me here. Um, I think uh, Minister uh, Diego Mesa is having some trouble, so we'll uh, we'll bring up the conversation with him if he's able to join us. But I started this poll just now, uh, you know, asking our viewers, our attendees, if COVID-19 has helped the fight against climate change. And I can see that um, that 66.67 percent of our attendees say that yes, they feel it has helped the fight against climate change. I want to now um, ask you to give your opening remarks on you know, your experience and what you're seeing currently um, in terms of how uh, you know, this, is, this has really impacted your country um, and then the overall uh, you know, global, uh, global landscape as well. Thank you. Thank you, Priha. Um, and, and thank you very much to Horizons for the, for the invitation. Uh, I want I want to send the, the the regards from the Minister of the Environment. She was the one the one that was invited, but in this in these times of of uh, very very unusual agendas, she wasn't she wasn't able to to attend this this invitation. Um, let me let me start by saying that COVID nineteen showed us how fragile life is, and that we must take action now. A green recovery depends on our ability to encompass. The needs of all. To do this, we need the participation and engagement of all actors where private sector plays a key role. Peru is approaching its bicentennial and has been taking firm steps to tackle climate change. First, we are implementing our 154 adaptation and mitigation measures identified by the NDC multi-sector working group uh, in 2018. This group was composed of 13 ministries and the National Center for Strategic Planning. Uh, the main business and financial associations were also actively engaged in this in these discussions. Recently, we have installed a high-level commission on climate change, which is a permanent body of ministerial level, uh, including the representation of subnational and governments and municipalities, and, and which expresses the commitment of Peru to extend it from the highest political level the national response to climate change. Second. During 2020, uh, we have been uh, implementing the climate change law and its by law, including the key policies to incorporate and promote climate action at a multi-sector, multi-level uh, level. Uh, we are developing some guidelines for the incorporation of adaptation and mitigation measures, as well as climate risk management in public and private investment projects. Third, this year we will submit our enhanced indices with greater ambition, transparency, and sense of urgency, both in adaptation and mitigations. Fourth, we have begun the process of updating our national climate change strategy with a long-term vision uh, to 2050 uh, using two main building blocks, Peru's national adaptation plan and the technical proposal for carbon neutrality by 2050. The new national climate change strategy will be launched next year after a comprehensive participatory process. Fifth, last February, Peru launched the Climate Action Roundtable with the private sector focused on sustainable development goal number three, which related to climate action to promote coordinated actions that allow us to reduce our vulnerability to the effects of climate change and achieve low, low carbon development. Under the climate action table, three specific initiatives were proposed to private organizations. The addition to Peruvian's carbon footprint platform, uh, which allows the private sector to increase their level of competitiveness. competitiveness. To date, we have uh, 251 organizations that are participating in the platform, of which 73% belong to the private sector. Uh, the signing of the clean production agreements, uh, which is a voluntary agreement between the Ministry of Environment of Peru and private sector organizations under a circular economy vision in their production processes. Today, we have seven agreements uh, with Coca-Cola Peru, uh, Bacus, that is a, a brewing company, Coplast, Pamolsa, Textil Amazonas, Acero Sarequipa, and, and Natura, the, the, the great Brazilian uh, cosmetic company and promote yeah. sustainability plans in companies. Um, 
these challenges seem to make uh, visible uh, the link with the, between sustainability actions and competitiveness in, in companies. Uh, some, some examples in the energy sector by 2050, Enel, the Italian energy company, will become an entirely carbon neutral company uh, operating here in Peru. Engie, a French company, will has committed to move towards carbon neutrality jointly with its employees, clients, and shareholders. And uh, we have uh, inaugurated the first public electric vehicle fast charger in Peru, courtesy of Primax and, and Shell. In agriculture and forestry, That's during last July, we have launched the Public-Private Coalition for Sustainable Production, a multi-stakeholder space for dialogue, commitment, and action, promoting sustainable jurisdictions and deforestation-free value chains with emphasis in the Amazon biome. In Peru, we firmly believe that the transition to a decarbonized future is not just our response to climate change and a great opportunity for competitive, sustainable, and efficient development, but an imperative in times when the world desperately needs to rebuild its economy and rescue jobs, but promoting a new and sound relationship with nature. Finally, Peru wishes to congratulate the Horizons Think Tank for this event that will allow us to share the actions we have been implementing for a green, low carbon and climate resilient development, where each small counts, each small effort counts to make a great change, so that no one is left behind. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much for those remarks. And um, we have we are also joined now by Minister Diego Mesa, Colombia's Minister for Mining and Energy. Welcome, Minister. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. To everyone. Good afternoon. Hi. We've just started, and um, the the first part of the um, of the of the um, you know sort of conference here, we've been focusing on whether you know what your country has done uh, lately to tackle the fight against climate change, and then we'll talk a little bit about has COVID nineteen helped this fight at all? Because we see that resources are now being put to use to ensure that you know every country and every industry is safe from the effects of COVID nineteen. So I want to st first start by asking you about you know your opening remarks on what Colombia has been doing in its fight against climate change, and then we'll take on the COVID-19 question. So the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you. And good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to be uh, here in this in this plenary uh, to talk about climate change. Uh, Colombia, it's, it's an interesting situation because uh, we are probably one of the lowest uh, emitters of CO2. Uh, we have uh, one of the cleanest power matrix in the world, I think is the sixth cleanest. Uh, we depend about two thirds on hydro dams, uh, which is a renewable energy, and, and the rest uh, is a mix of thermal. However, uh, we are highly vulnerable to climate change events, especially because we depend so much on hydropower. So when we have uh, El Nino phenomenon, uh, our water levels go down, and that puts a lot of pressure into the system. So one of the policies that we decided to promote, and it's been uh, one of our main initiatives in this sector, in the energy sector, uh, was to incorporate into the matrix uh, unconventional renewables, variable uh, energy, such as wind and solar. Um, when we came into, into this administration, Colombia had less than 1% of the matrix made up of renewables, of unconventional renewables. Uh, we did two auctions last, last year, uh, which we were quite successful. Uh, and now we've awarded um, projects that by the end of 2022, when our administration ends, uh, we'll have about 13 uh, percent of unconventional renewables. And that would make the matrix much more, much cleaner than what it is now, even though it's quite clean. Um, but it will help us be more resilient uh, to climate change events. And we do have significant uh, solar and wind um, potential, especially in the north of the country. Uh, so that's one of the of our key uh, initiatives. And of course, this will help us meet uh, with our SDG uh, objectives and with our uh, COP21 agreement uh, commitments. Um, the the other um, you know the other action that we've done uh, is that we are promoting. Uh, what we call sustainable mobility, which is a mix not only of uh, electric vehicles, uh, but also much cleaner uh, uh, fossil fuels, uh, such as you know, gasoline with lower uh, levels of um, 
uh, CO2 emissions and also uh, increasing the use of uh, biofuels. Uh, and we're very proud that after introducing a number of policies in 2019, including a national uh, electric mobility bill, um, we were the leaders on electric vehicle sales in Latin America in 2019, and this continues to grow uh, this year. So those are the two main uh, angles that we're using, uh, you know, making the power generation matrix much more, uh, much cleaner, uh, but at the same time more resilient because of the vulnerability that we have as, as Colombia uh, because of our location and working on mobility, uh, both for mass transportation and also uh, for individual uh, vehicles, trying to, uh, you know, recover that fleet Obviously, that will take a long time, but we're making very good progress on, on that front. And as as a sector, uh, I'm responsible for mining, energy, and oil and gas. Uh, we're also uh, we were the first minister in Colombia to have a climate change uh, strategy uh, for the sector. So we're also promoting uh, you know recycle and reuse uh, activities in different sectors, uh, and we also contribute to. Uh, reforestation efforts that are being led um, by the by the government, by the president himself. So that's that's kind of like a quick summary of what we've done and how we're um, you know moving and progressing uh, very rapidly on this front. Uh, and and we expect to you know continue to have much much more uh, renewables, unconventional renewables into our matrix, uh, and we expect to promote uh, the clean or sustainable mobility uh, strategy uh, going forward. Thank you. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and before we go on to the next question, I oh, I see that we have got some very interesting uh, set of attendees that I can see that on the right hand side. I urge you all to send your questions, comments. Let's make it, um, you know, a lively discussion. And, uh, you know, we'll we'll pick up your questions as we go along and uh, give, you know, pose it to uh, the minister and the deputy minister here. But I want to now touch upon COVID-19. And I know that we've been talking a lot this year, um, as I said in my own opening remarks, that when we went into last year, the climate change was on the top of agenda for everyone, every country, industries. It was, was one of the biggest topics that we discussed at that point of time. But starting 2020 uh, January, the only focus uh, for us has been COVID-19 and how do we deal with COVID-19. A pandemic of this nature is not something we've ever dealt with in our lifetimes. Um, and this, it also means to say that it's not, the, it's not once in a century sort of pandemic. This is something that can happen again. Um, having said that, all our resources are now put towards, you know, protecting our people, protecting our industries. And something like climate change may have taken a backseat. I want to ask uh, both of you, and I want to start with Minister uh, Diego Mesa here first, um, on how do you think COVID-19 has played out uh, in your country um, with regards to climate change initiatives? Have, do you think it's helped the fight against climate change or it has posed more uh, restrictions? And then I'll go on to Deputy Minister Kehandria. Uh, thank you. Yes, I think I think it has helped uh, the climate change uh, fight, if, if you want to call it uh, that. Uh, and, and the reason for this is I think people are much more conscious uh, about the impact of you know our activities uh, to the climate. Uh, for example, I was speaking before about mobility and uh, about sustainable mobility, and I think you know, obviously people have reduced significantly. Uh, you know, how much they use their cars. Uh, and obviously, you know, we have policies for people to work remotely from home, uh, which started, as in many countries, with uh, very strict quarantines. Uh, but now that we've been lifting uh, those restrictions, people have decided uh, to use virtual tools much more frequently. And you can see this, especially on the quality of air. That's something that we monitor in the main cities in Colombia because in some of our cities, uh, quality of air, uh, it, it's, it's very critical to the health of the people. And sometimes we even have to have uh, restrictions to mobility even before COVID just to bring down uh, the level of pollution in the cities. And obviously, during the COVID-19 uh, emergency, we've seen those levels go down naturally, uh, but people are gaining much more conscious uh, about, you know, that we need to do more to fight climate or climate change. Um, so so I, I do agree, I, I think it's been an accelerator uh, and we've seen it as, as such. Uh, for example, you know, I was talking before about sales 
of electric vehicles. Uh, it was very, very uh, surprising, but it was a pleasant surprise to see that the first semester of 2020, we had one of the highest rates of sales of electric vehicles, um, notwithstanding uh, the, the pandemic. The pandemic. So, so that's a clear sign that I think people are more, more conscious. Uh, they now understand that we need to continue to foster policies that will help us fight uh, climate change. Uh, and, and I think, you know, COVID-19 has been a, a great opportunity. At the same time, um, we launched a reactivation plan for the economy, but we did it in a way that one of the main uh, uh, pillars is what we've called cleaner or more, more sustainable growth. And we're putting a lot of emphasis on projects for uh, unconventional renewable energies, uh, as I said before, uh, sustainable mobility, and obviously there is a component of job creation. But, you know, the sustainable growth uh, concept is something that it's now, I think, embedded not only in the government policies, but also in Colombian citizens. Perfect. Um, I want to go to Deputy Minister Kehandria now. So your views on Thank this. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Um, and, I, and I absolutely agree with, with Minister Mesa. Uh, I, I think, and, and with you, I think climate change has been in, in, in the top of, of, of the priorities of, of, of people since, I would say, since Copenhagen in 2009. I think that the, the, the failure of that of that intent of having a, 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 a global a global agreement uh, led uh, much attention to, to to the discussion on climate change, uh, and 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 I think it peaked in in 2015 in in, in Paris. I think we've we've lost some some momentum from from the political highest highest level of, of decision with some shifts in in, in political conduction in certain uh, very very important countries. But I think climate change is absolutely established uh, in the public opinion and 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 and, and, and this in in the society. And I think COVID nineteen has shown us that that that. Uh, the environment uh, as as a whole, not only cl the climate change agenda, is something very very important, and it's something absolutely embedded in uh, uh, promoting the in, in the promotion of development. Development could couldn't could not happen if we have a dysfunctional relationship with nature. So I, I think COVID has helped. Uh, in, in terms of, of making this absolutely clear to people and make people more eager to ask for this, to demand this, to, to ask decision makers in terms of, uh, the, the, in terms of projects, in terms of initiatives that show the, 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 the road, uh, through, uh, to, to these transitions that were already happening. Because we, we have to remember that the inclusion of renewables in our, in our energy matrices, electromobility and, and the, the promotion of this uh, deforestation free production chains, mainly in, in, in the Amazon, were already in, in, in place and were already happening. Maybe not, not moving at, uh, fast enough or going deeper enough. But, but, but I think right now with, with COVID, there is the, 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 the view of the need of to, to, to push farther in, 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 in this direction. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the Inter-American Development Bank and the International Labor Organization had published recently, uh, a study on, on, on the, the effect of, of, uh, decarbonization as part of the recovery plans of the Latin, of, of the countries, of developing countries in the world. Uh, and, 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 and they have, uh, found that, uh, a bet to, to decarb decarbonize the, the economy could generate 15, 15 million, uh, new jobs, uh, in, in, in Latin America, for instance. Uh, so, so that's that's something that it's that it's very important and needs to be incorporated as part of the of the response to 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 COVID nineteen, but also to the response to climate change. And finally, I think uh, COVID nineteen is is a is an opportunity to practice, an opportunity to practice uh, uh, against uh, major challenges as climate change, because COVID nineteen has shown us. Uh, some of the of the issues of of the of the uh, development and an environmental agenda that were not uh, not being covered enough and and and, and have been 
and, and COVID-19 has become a catalyzer uh, to, 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 to complicate the, the, the figure uh, or the panorama more. So that is something that will happen as well with climate change. So we, we, we need to practice our responses now with, with COVID to be prepared for, for climate change. Perfect. Thank you very much. I'm going to pick up a question from one of our attendees, Aneta Nies. Uh, she's former Dutch cabinet minister and an economist. Um, her question is, to what extent do the speakers believe that international cooperation is in, in innovation can make a major contribution to the development of new tech for sustainability solutions? Or is it better to have national innovation? That's a great question, Aneta. Um, uh, minister uh, Messa, can I, can I start with you first on this? Sure. No, I, I think international cooperation is key. It's a way to complement uh, national developments and national initiatives. Uh, we in Colombia do work with uh, different partners, uh, such as you know the U.S., the European Union, uh, Switzerland, um, uh, the U.K., and we try to you know combine strategies that are developed uh, in Colombia uh, with technical assistance. Uh, expertise and resources uh, from international cooperation. And we have uh, significant success. For example, you know, I spoke about the auction on unconventional renewables from last year. That auction was uh, quite successful for many reasons, but one of them was uh, significant innovation in public policy in how we designed the auction and the auction uh, a product. And for that auction, we received significant technical assistance for, from many different parties, such as USAID, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, experts from Chile that you know, had more experience with uh, designing auctions for unconventional renewables in Colombia. And we're able to do something that uh, no other country has done before. Uh, our auction was the first auction in the world uh, that was a double auction with both uh, generators of power and buyers uh, came to a platform that was designed by the mm -hmm. government and we didn't have a single buyer as many unconventional auctions are uh, running the world. So that was a product of, you know, having international cooperation, uh, but also with a significant component of a national uh, initiative, and, you know, national uh, policy design. So, so I do think it's important to have and I think uh, we should be able to combine both. I think you, you've muted your mic. Yes. Apologies. Uh, Deputy Minister Kehandria. Thank you, Priha. Um, in, in, in the case of Peru, it has been uh, very, very important also as well to have the, the, the support of, of international cooperation. Um, I, I, I will want, want to, to, to make, to make a, a, clear, a clear statement about um, how, how this these new mechanisms that, that international cooperation uh, is, is promoting as, as the result-based uh, support we are, we, are, we, are, we are using, for instance, to promote the, the, the red, red activities in, in, in the country to reduce the deforestation and, and, forest, and forest degradation are uh, very, very interesting new, new tools uh, to, to, to channel international cooperation. They are challenging us because uh, this, this, these are not uh, traditional projects that we, you receive the money up front and, and, and then you, you, you perform the, the activities, but you have to perform before for you to, 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 to receive the money. So, so this, this, is, this is something very, very interesting that it's becoming uh, the, the, the norm. For, for, for middle, middle, highly middle income economies, highly middle income countries uh, such as, such as Colombia and, uh, and Peru. And, and I think, uh, it's, 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 it's helping us to align our policies, to put different ministries or, or the national government and subnational governments that are in charge, for instance, of the, of the management of the tropical forest in, in our Amazon area in, in, in the same page. Uh, they having, ha all, all of us having to, to, to develop a, a common vision and, and, and to align our policies, our, our interventions. So I, I think that's, that, that, that's critical. And, and I think uh, in, in the future, technical cooperation uh, will, will still be, be, be key. I think uh, resources will, will always be important, 
but are, are relatively less less important now because countries countries like like, like ours are are able to to to, to to seek for 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 money coming from from the private sector from from other sources. So, but 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 uh, but international cooperation will be key uh, in in generating these these capacities to attract these new these new flows of of, of resource. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I want to just go back to COVID now and, uh, you know, sort of discuss, uh, sort of zoom out a little bit and talk about businesses. Um, so taking the UK, for example, I know that when the lockdown was announced and we are still sort of in semi lockdown state right now where uh, people weren't allowed to take, uh, you know, go to work. So everybody was at home and you started to see things like air quality index come back to normal. Um, and then suddenly everybody was said, you know, you start going back to work. Don't take the subway, but still go to work. So they started driving so there were more cars on the road there was more pollution this just shows us that we are we are sort of going back to normal at some point in our lives which will be next year or the year after whenever when businesses do go back to normal what are the other countries equipped by that point of time to be able to take on the climate change fight again? Second, are businesses genuinely actively evolving decarbonizing policies? Do you see that in your space right now? Um, I'm happy to start with either of you. I mean, whoever wants to go first, really. I'm, I'm happy to go first. Uh, no. I, I do think that as we go back to, to you know, a pre-COVID uh, situation, I think uh, companies, I don't know if they're going to be ready, but I think they're going to be uh, readier, if, if you wish, to continue the, the fight with, uh, against climate change. Uh, I think businesses... Uh, especially in our sector in Colombia and the mining and oil and gas sector in particular, are now taking steps uh, toward uh, having a better mitigation policies uh, for the carbon footprint. Uh, for example, our national company uh, in Colombia, which is a co uh, they've now developed two uh, solar farms uh, in their main production fields, and they are generating uh, from from, so from sun from sun their energy for their production sites. Uh, and that's a significant uh, step towards uh, having a much more sustainable production of oil and gas. And other companies are following suit uh, in the oil and gas business. And now we're also starting to see mining companies uh, doing the same, uh, setting up either you know solar farms or small uh, hydroelectric dams, uh, because in Colombia, given the fact that we have uh, a very mountainous uh, landscape, it's very easy to have uh, flow of the river um, um, energy generation. So, so I do think, uh, especially in, in, in mining and energy and oil and gas space, uh, we've seen this uh, movement uh, or progression uh, towards having a much more sustainable production, which is what we would like to see. And I think uh, we're also seeing the same uh, in the transportation side in general, and we see companies much more aware of the footprint that they use. Obviously, they won't um, change or slow down uh, their production capacity, but they will adapt and you know bring other technologies into their mix to make sure that the footprint uh, is reduced. And uh, as I said before, I do believe that COVID nineteen has been an accelerator uh, and has helped uh, speed up this process. Sure, Deputy, I, Deputy I, Minister Kehandra. Yes, I agree with with Minister Mesa. We 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 we've seen the the, the same the same pattern here here in Peru, uh, and regarding regarding the the energy sector and and the mining sector that are taking steps towards uh, sustainability in, in general. This is something that was already happening before COVID nineteen, and I think that the the, the the momentum hasn't hasn't uh, stopped. So so they 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 are still pushing in in that direction. Uh, but, but we see a major challenge in, in, in terms, and, and I'm, let, let me go back to, to COVID-19 surfacing uh, some some of the of the major structural problems in, 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 in other in other cases as the transport sector here in Peru or the the, the, the rural sector informality is, is is one of the of the key issues and informality is is is, is something that we need to tackle in in order to be able to move to move a, a sustainability agenda uh, uh, forward so 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 we have we have to work uh, together 
uh, with with the ministries of finance, with the ministry that that, that promote uh, formalization in order uh, for 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 the private sector, the, the small scale private sector, to be able to engage in these policies that that that, that, that focus in, uh, in in the response to climate to climate change. Uh, we need we need also the, the formal uh, private sector to be able to pull the informal private sector or the small scale private sector with them and to help them to to to, to walk this path uh, towards towards sustainability we are working in in, in in that direction because also the, this this is the direction where the consumers are asking the companies to go to go to so so right right now ev everyone is, is asking for reduced environmental impact in, in, in their consumption. So there is there is no other way. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. We only have three minutes, 52 seconds left or 50 now. Um, so closing remarks, my question to you is we've talked about com countries, we've talked about businesses. As individuals, as consumers, as uh, you know, uh, global citizens, what is it that we should be doing uh, in, in our, in our uh, fight towards climate change in, in you know, making sure that we mitigate the risks that the climate change is posing? Um, so those will be the closing remarks. So can I start with Minister, uh, Minister first? Sure, thank you, Priya. Uh, I think as, as individuals, one, uh, one place in, in which we can be uh, much more proactive uh, is in the space of energy efficiency. Uh, and I think, you know, making a much better use of, of energy, uh, either to, you know, having uh, the, the equipment, the light bulbs, uh, the different, uh, uh, that they can give you, you know, a much better use uh, of energy. I think it's, it's key. And we've seen that in Colombia. I mean, we for example, we started uh, to have a program in which we uh, changed, for example, the fridge uh, families of low income uh, and for, you know, with a significant subsidy uh, so they can have uh, much higher energy efficiency um, um, equipment in their in their homes. And we've also changed, for example, light bulbs uh, in uh, households of low income. And that shows uh, how we can work towards fighting climate change, but at the same time, generating savings for these families. And that creates conscious for them and they know it's good for the environment. Uh, but it's also good for uh, their their pockets as well, which I think obviously is a good incentive to have. So I think individually is just to make sure that we are conscious of every action that we do. I think we can. Uh, you can see my kid running behind my screen. That's absolutely uh, fine. <laughs> to become a, a typical image of the virtuality. So I think I think that's something that we can continue to work and make sure that everyone is conscious about that. Perfect. Thank you. And a big hi to your son. Um, let's go over to uh, Deputy Minister Kehendria for your closing remarks. Thank you, Priha. I think, I think uh, society needs to be, um, needs to pressure and needs to be present and needs to, to call uh, us, the decision makers, to, to, to not to lose focus. And to, and to be aware that climate change is still there and is still a threat to, to, to our economy, to our society. So I, I think uh, that, that is something that, that, it, that it's important. We are, we are in, in Peru, we are entering an, an electoral phase uh, very, very, very soon. We're going to have a new government in, in, in July 2021. So we need uh, society to, to, to ask for, for, a, for a serious and deep discussion on climate change, on sustainability, to be, to be part of the discussion, of the political discussions of, of all, of all the, the, the parties here, here in Peru, and, 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 to, and to keep momentum and, and, and to continue pushing with, with, with some policies uh, that, that have been launched by, by, by this and, and previous governments regarding climate change and, 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 and not, not, not lose the momentum, I think, I think that's, that, that's the key message. Thank you very much. Perfect. Well, thank you both uh, quite a lot for this uh, brilliant and interesting conversation. It's been a pleasure to host you. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister Diego Mesa, uh, Colombia's Minister for Mining and Energy, and uh, Deputy Minister for Peru, Gabriel Quijandria. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you, everyone, to all the uh, attendees as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hasta luego. Hasta luego, ministro.
Encantado. Uh, viceministro, encantado de conocerlo. Está muy Igualmente. bien y suerte con las elecciones. Gracias. Nos vemos. Oh.